So go ahead and remain standing. When worship's over, I hope you'll go back to somebody you didn't get a chance to say hello to and connect with them, somebody you can talk with, pray with, encourage. Amen. We are going to read Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Be seated, please. First story I want to tell you should remind you why the heat and the humidity of this place delight me. They do not discourage me. And so even though last night I was sweating without an air conditioner, I would rather have the heat than what I'm about to describe any day. 57 below wind chill. 13 below straight up temperature. I am driving down a two-lane county road at 5.45 in the morning for a Bible study that we called Way Too Early Bible Study. And it was. And there was a handful of us men that gathered together in our church building on Thursdays at 6 o'clock to read the scripture, drink coffee, and get to work. I was about two miles up the road with the wind chill at 50, negative 57 with negative 13 temperature when my tire blew. I will take heat over the cold every single day. And so I pull off to the side of the road and I realize this is, this is going to be awful. And that's not the word that I use. And so I get out there and I pop the trunk and I begin to go through the process of changing this tire and doing what I can. And I, I got to admit, Marissa is the handy woman in our house, not me. Anything that gets fixed is by her and not by Jeff. Anything I do to help is, well, it never happens. I don't get to help at all. But I'm proud enough to say I'm going to figure out how to make this ch to change this tire on my own. So I'm busting on those lug nuts. And I'm loosening them up. And I get them to where they're able to spin off. And I get the first, and I get the second, and I get the third. And then finally I realize I've got every lug nut loose and ready to go. And I forgot to jack it up. I, you probably would not have voted for me to become your pastor if you would have known that beforehand. I am not Mr. Handyman. There is something about getting the order right that is absolutely necessary to getting to where you want to go, correct? So I screwed those lug nuts back on and I jacked that tire up finally, got them changed and was able to get to where I was going, but I'm so embarrassed to have admitted it that I didn't tell a single soul until 10.16, which is right now. <laughs> When you get the order of your energy out of whack, you will not get to the place that God has created for you to go. When you get things out of order, you will miss what God has in store for you, and you will end up like I did, putting all of this energy into something that's not going to get you anywhere. And so I bet in your life, in your soul, and even in our church, you have spun the lug nuts over and over again, only to realize you are not creating movement. You are not generating energy. You are not going where you want to go. These last three weeks, I have tried to talk about what is at the absolute core of my faith and my ministry so that you could understand what I think is the absolute necessary order to understand the gospel, to see what Jesus Christ can do in your church. Two weeks ago, I said that we had to have a God like Jesus. Anybody remember that theme? We need a God like Jesus. We have to have clarity about what the gospel is and who Jesus is, and we need to erase all the lines about who the gospel is for. Because who is the gospel for? Everyone. Repeat after me everyone. 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 Last week, we looked at Zacchaeus. 
and how Jesus has a mission. We need a God like Jesus, and we need a mission like Jesus. The people that we move away from, Jesus is moving towards in order to invite them into vulnerable, accountable conversations so that they can understand what it means to be in right relationship with God and with other people. Anybody got jacked up relationships with people around them? Anybody have struggled with God? Jesus, we need a mission like his so that we can be aligned with God and be connected to other people. If we need a God like Jesus and we need a mission like Jesus, we need a church like Jesus. We need a church that looks like Jesus. Now, when you get clarity of who Jesus is and you understand the marching orders that he's given, then you're finally able to build a church. But if you start at the other end, and say, I want my church. Then you start to lay all of your baggage and all of your preferences at the center of what should be the gospel. Sometimes, I don't know, I know it's never happened in this church, but churches that I've been a part of go to battle over their preferences about how we worship and who we're for and what we're about. But that looks at things all the wrong way. If you have a church that then somehow finds a mission, Jesus usually kind of gets sprinkled on at the end and it's not the core. But if Jesus is the core, and you begin with him, and that Jesus Christ crucified is the only reason we have hope for eternity, and the only thing that can get us up out of bed to come sit in a sweaty room like this, I'm not doing this for anybody else. I mean, God bless you all, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for Jesus. When you understand who Jesus is and the mission he has sent us on, then you begin to organize your church in a way that looks exactly like Jesus. Our world today doesn't need churches that are bigger or smaller or more traditional or more contemporary or more liberal or more conservative, more charismatic. We need more churches that look like Jesus Christ. And when you do that, Jesus is irresistible. Jesus is absolutely irresistible. That's why when you look at this text that we read here in Acts, we should not be surprised at this summary of what the early church looked like. So I was going to do it for like three minutes. I'm going to do it in 30 seconds here. Acts 2 is all about how the church got born. The Holy Spirit shows up. Everybody begins to speak in an unknown language. It says that 3,000 people came to faith in one day. Can you imagine how big the water bill is for that baptistry? 3,000 people come to faith in one day. And then we get these words. That Luke writes down. That they gather together. That they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That they sold resources that they had in order to bless people that were in need. That there was awe and wonder all around them because the Spirit of the Lord was there. And then that last tagline I loved. The Lord added daily to their number those who were being saved. You know what that church looks like to me? That church looks like Jesus. The Jesus that preached the Sermon on the Mount created a church where people were devoted to his teachings. The Jesus that walked on water and raised the dead created a community where awe and wonder and miracles were the norm. The Jesus that challenged the rich young ruler to sell his possessions and give them to the poor created a community where people were radically generous, not giving their leftovers, but their first fruits to God so that no one in their midst did without. And the Jesus who destroyed and sullied up his reputation by who he ate with created a church where people were breaking bread day and night with anyone and everyone so that they could be in this Jesus community and the Jesus who said, I came to seek and save the lost, created a church where the Lord added daily to their number those who are being saved. You know, I'm, I'm 43 years old. And i got to tell you, I have a dream that by the time I retire, that we have one year where the Lord adds daily to the number of those beer being saved. It was the norm in the early church. I'd like it to be the norm in this community. Amen. 365 days in a year, 365 people added to the faith. And when we do this, when we get the 
formula correct, when we get the order laid out correctly, people will see that the church is irresistible, not because of how smart we are, but because Jesus is irresistible. I don't want anybody walking away from here ever saying, you know, the preaching's really good and the music's awesome. I want people to walk away from here and say, we worship a mighty God who is still doing a miraculous work in the hearts of his people. But if we get the order wrong, we become a museum. If we get the order wrong, we become a social club that prays before they eat. And we better have the pastor do it because that's your job. If, did I step on anybody's toes yet? If we get the order wrong, we will lay at the altar what we want rather than saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. We get the order right when we say we need a God like Jesus and a mission like Jesus and a church like Jesus. But if we don't get the order correct, we're out there spinning love nuts when it's 57 below and wondering why we're not going anywhere. That is our prayer today. I said this as clearly as I could in my notes to see if I can get it right because I couldn't print it off. <laughs> Christian maturity has nothing to do with tenure or longevity and everything to do with how white hot a passion you have to build a church that looks like Jesus Christ. That is the measure of Christian maturity. Jesus Christ has a mission to restore lost souls and to reshape the world to where a new creation on earth as it is in heaven begins to flow through people like you and people like me. I think we are called to give ourselves to nothing less than building a church that looks like Jesus. I read a story last summer about two men in Germany. They lived in a nursing home. And if you haven't been to a nursing home, let's just be real honest here. It's not always the most inspiring place. It can be difficult. Loved ones that are there, sick staff that sacrifice for themselves, that uh, for the sake of others, that are often underpaid and underappreciated. Or there are two men in a nursing home in Germany that realized they kind of had enough of where they were living. And so they broke out one afternoon. They broke out. And they didn't break out to go to the bar. And they didn't break out to go see their family. There in Germany, they have every summer called the Awakened Heavy Metal Festival. Oh. That is the largest collection of headbangers in, in Central Europe. And where do you think these two men went? This is where they went to go and rock it out. And, and they, I love this line. They said they knew they couldn't miss Judas Priest. Yeah. So, man, when I'm 87 years old in a nursing home, I want Leather Rebel on repeat. They I know not very many people listen to that. But I want to be like this guy. So when they finally found these guys passed out at a heavy metal concert, they woke them up and cleared their mind, and they, they were described in the, repeat, in the police report as being dazed and confused. <laughs> we are going to pour ourselves out in this world for so many things that are of no consequence. Not that Judas Priest is of no consequence. <laughs> Hear me correctly. I want us to be sold out to a God that looks like Jesus, to a mission that looks like Jesus, so that we can build a church that looks like Jesus. And when we get that right, people will knock down walls. They will sit in sweaty rooms. They will do amazing things just to be in the presence of the Lord and to gather with his people who believe in him. Don't you want a church that looks like Jesus? Amen. That's what I want for. Let's take a moment and pray today. God, we love you. And we are so grateful for this gift that you've given us. Lord, forgive us if we ever feel entitled, like there's some space that's ours. This is your church, God. Nothing less. I have gratitude today for so many people that made their way here because they are hungry for your word and for your people. May they have found nourishment today in the reading of Scripture community that we find. There is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, God. Yes. And we know that it is the spirit of the Lord. Lord, cultivate inside of us a passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He died in our place for our sin 
so that we can be forgiven and that we can have a life that never ends. Lord, send us to people around us so that they can experience this great love. And may all that we do as a church reflect our passion for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to roll right into communion now and give us an opportunity to break bread and to share in the cup. So for those that are serving, if you make your way back, Mike is going to have us set up. You're going to come forward like you usually do and come through the center aisle. You'll be able to make your way around and we'll have people that are serving here in the front. Communion is open to everyone. Everyone who follows Jesus is invited to receive communion at this table. We want you to know that communion is for everyone because as we say most every week, the gospel is for everyone. But it's also a good reminder of why we need this table. Jesus' body is broken because we were broken. Jesus' blood was poured out because we have poured our lives out for things that ultimately do not matter. But when we receive communion, it is God's way of binding us back together. We are made whole through broken bread. Would you pray with me? God, we ask your blessing upon the giving and receiving of this cup. May it be for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are so grateful for the opportunity that we have to receive these symbols of your grace. And we're so grateful for the people around us that have encouraged us to share it with others. We now join together in one church praying the prayer that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.